Hello, welcome to the MIT Category Seminar. So today we have Jade Master from Riverside. He's going to talk about the open algebraic path problem. Welcome. Hi, thanks. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about the algebraic path problem, which is a generalization of the shortest path problem um, for many other contexts in optimization and computer science. In particular, I'm going to talk about ways to think about the algebraic path problem in contexts which have networks which are left open to their surroundings via boundaries. So there's going to be three parts to this talk. Um, first, I'm going to talk about sort of the general strategy of compositionality um, in this context that um, various people like John Baez and uh, Kenny Corser and Brendan Fong have been working on. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the algebraic path problem in particular. And then the last thing, I'm going to combine the first two sections and make the algebraic path problem more open. Um, and that sounds very enigmatic, but it'll mean something. <laughs> so the first section uh, is compositionality. Um, so the idea is basically that you have some type of network that lives in a category C. So let's see, it's the category where your networks are objects. And you're usually interested in computing something about that network. And then call that D of A for an object A and C. So for examples of what that could be, could be maybe shortest paths or equilibrium points, um, various maybe uh, data like clustering coefficients or things like that, <laughs> information about your network. Um, but the problem is that when A is very large, this computation of D of A can be very, very expensive. So a very common strategy to handle that is to try to split the computation into smaller components and then glue the smaller components together to get the global computation. And that's sort of uh, what, what the goal of, of doing this, not the only goal, but one of the goals. So a little bit um, about how this works very briefly before I get into it for real, um, is you start with some way of taking sets and turning them into discrete Cs. Um, so that's like a C with, with just, that's basically just a set. There's no connections or interesting network data on that set. Um, and then once you have that, you can think about an open object of C as a diagram like this. Um, and the idea is that these two arrows on this Cospan, which is a diagram, um, point out the boundaries of your of A. So if like A is uh, is directed graphs, L X and L Y could be discrete graphs on the sets X and Y. And these two maps would point out input and output nodes, sort of making it into now an open graph rather than just a regular graph. And uh, these form the morphisms of a by category, um, which is kind of like a category except it's more complicated. Um, and the composition of these morphisms is basically gluing of open systems. So you have two open systems. You can take the output of one and the input of the other and glue them together. So basically, at least one of my goals is to lift the computations of D, these data things, to functors. Uh, so a functor of this type. From, from the by category of open C's to the by category of open S's. S's is maybe the category where uh, D of A lives in. It's the semantics category. And the reason why you want to do this is because uh, if you have a functor like this, then it, the functoriality of it, the functoriality part of a functor you may be familiar with is saying that F of G composed with F is equal to F of G composed with F of F. Um, in this case, this corresponds to an isomorphism between the gluing of open networks or the data computed on a larger composite open network and the composite of the data computed on each component. So really what this is doing is it's telling you how to build up a global computation using smaller local data. And the local data in this equation I've written here is D of A and D of B as open networks from x to y and y to z. 
So we're going to talk about this in the situation when D computes the solution to the algebraic path problem. So what's the algebraic path problem I'm about to tell you? What if I told you that finding the shortest path on a weighted graph, finding the most likely paths in a Markov process, this list is going to be long, <laughs> computing the maximum capacity of a network, computing the transitive closure of a directed graph, and determining the language of a non-deterministic finite state machine were all instances of the free monoid construction. So when I first heard all this stuff, I was pretty blown away that uh, all this stuff could be captured in the same sort of framework. And it seemed like a very useful thing that I think more people should know about because it really allows you to kick up the generality of your work a lot. Um, so to explain the algebraic path problem, I'm going to start with the first example I've written here, uh, which is finding the shortest paths on a weighted graph. Um, so to do that, first you talk about a rig of the positive real numbers, including infinity. And this is sort of a confusing rig because it's equipped with the reverse of the usual ordering. Um, and also the plus is given by infinum or minimum if it's finite. And the multiplication is given by plus, which is sort of this reverse wacko world. But the reason why you do this is because it makes things work out pretty well. So in general, a weighted graph is a function from x times x to q, a weighted graph valued in q. Um, you can draw it like this picture I've shown here. And also, you can think about it as a matrix, which I've also drawn below. Um, so the tuples on the edges here, those represent the weights on the edges in both directions. So you can see this, maybe this 2, 3 here on the weighted graph corresponds to this entry of two and entry of three on this matrix. So what you can do is you can take this matrix and you can multiply it by itself. So once you do that, um, you can use the regular old formula for matrix multiplication, the sum of the entries over every possible entry in the middle and you multiply them in this way. But in the case when you're working in the, the rig zero infinity with plus is infinum and multiplication is plus, um, then you end up with taking this infinum over all sums of edges, of two edges, which stop somewhere at an edge L in between. So if you think about what this infinum means, really what you're doing is you're, you're, you're thinking about all the paths which take two steps and you're taking the minimum path between i and j. That take two steps. <laughs> so the matrix product, the entries of it give the pass from i to j, the shortest pass from i to j which occur in two steps when you're valued over this rig. Similarly, uh, you can do the same thing for m raised to the nth power and you get the same thing but for n sets. So um, the Entries of, the, of m to the n represent the shortest path between all pairs, which contain n steps. And definitely stop me if anyone has questions. Or... Uh, yeah, Jade, there's one for understanding. So they're asking, mm -hmm. where do we use that the order is reversed? Shouldn't we use the ordinary infimum as opposed to the reversed infimum? Oh, it is the ordinary infimum. Um, and we're not using reverse ordering yet, but really the generality that is, I think, nicest to think about this is when Q is actually a quantile. Um, and a quantile is a post set um, that has all joins and also ha has a monoidal structure. And when it has all joins, usually the join would be the soup rather than the imp. Um, but that's where you use the reverse ordering so you can get the join to be the imp. And also sort of intuitive, okay, that's sort of, um, a long explanation of why, but also it is the explanation. Another reason is that it's sort of intuitively um, zero is infinity. So infinity means that there's no connection whatsoever between a pair of nodes in that direction. So at least intuitively, it's like we're thinking 
of smaller values of having a greater weight because it indicates a greater connection. So that's maybe another reason. Thank you. I think that answers the question. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so right, so if you compute these n-fold matrix products of n, you get shortest paths which occur in n steps. So if you want to find the shortest paths in general, um, you want to take the infinum over all of the mn, because the shortest path can occur in any number of steps, and you want to find the minimum. Um, and so basically, you want to compute this thing f of m. And this infinum, when you work it out, ends up being this infinite sum of matrices. Um, and where this infinite sum is taken to be valued in this positive real number rig with infinum and plus. And the algebraic path problem uh, seeks to compute this sum, but more generally over a different quantile or a different rig. And uh, you may object that there are issues about whether or not this even exists, because um, it's a, it's an infinum in a general rig, um, and whether or not it's unique. And the level of generality to guarantee both existence and uniqueness for this problem that we're going to use is a quantal. So a quantal is a monoidal closed preorder with all comets. That's sort of the N lab definition but um, a little bit more spelled out. You have a preorder and you have a multiplication map on that preorder. You can take joins of all elements, which are kind of like maximums, and the multiplication map preserves all co-elements. Co That's the closed part. And if you have a quantile, then you can form the set of matrices valued in that quantile over x. And then you can equip that set with an ordering that one matrix is less than another, uh, if and only if each entry is less than the entry of the other matrix. And it turns out that if you start with the commutative quantile, then the post set of matrices um, valuing that quantile over X is also a quantile. So that's, that's nice because on uh, the free monoid, if you are familiar with free monoids, uh, it can be computed as this infinite co-product of all the words in a, in a set A of length n for every n bigger than or equal to zero. Um, whoops. And this looks awfully familiar, which is pretty cool in my opinion, um, because it's basically the same formula as the algebraic path problem. And this is an coincidence. Um, the algebraic path problem is also computing a free monoid. It's just in this category, mat q of x. And because mat q of x is a quantile, um, you are, the free monoid exists, it always exists, and it also forms the left adjoint of an adjunction. And that's because uh, the category map QX is nice enough. Um, so this adjunction, what it does is it uh, takes a matrix and it generates the free monoid on that matrix. And then the right adjoint is forgetful. Um, it takes a idempotent matrix and it turns it, does nothing to it, just thinks about it as a regular matrix. And I guess that's something I should mention is that monoids uh, in this category, mat QX, are the same as idempotent matrices. Um, and that's something that um, proves sort of multiply. The idea is basically that the multiplication map says that M squared is less than or equal to M, and the identity map says that uh, M is greater than one. And if you combine those two equations, you get that m squared is equal to m. So that's why I'm using inmat, because that's the matrices which are idempotent. So even more generally, uh, the path problem, you can choose all these different sorts of rigs and get uh, all sorts of different optimization problems that just pop out of it. 
Um, so here's a table of some of the optimization problems you can compute by choosing different regs. Um, so one that I think is particular interesting that I like to point out is when the post set is true and false and the join is or and the multiplication is and. So a matrix valued in true or false is the same as a directed graph. Here's it saying between any two pairs of nodes, is there an edge or isn't there one? And when you compute the algebraic path problem or the free monoid on one of these directed graphs, you're going to end up with the transitive closure of that directed graph. Another interesting one is the language recognized by a non-deterministic finite state machine. Um, and if you use a power set over the language on some set as your quantile, then that's what you get. So that's a pretty powerful one. Um, okay. Just checking the time. All right, so um, now we're going to make it open. So before we make it open, uh, we need to think about the category of matrices over an arbitrary set, not just over a fixed set. And that kind of category looks like this. You have matrices over an arbitrary set as objects. And as morphisms, you have a function between the sets that the matrices are on, satisfying this inequality. So basically, the weights cannot increase when you map them over to a new matrix. And also, the free monoid adjunction, or the algebraic path problem adjunction that I talked about a bit ago, um, can be extended to an adjunction on this category, where in mat Q is the same category as mat Q, or it's, except it's only consisting of idempotent matrices. So a Q matrix, you can make it open by equipping it with input and output boundaries. So here's an open Q matrix. Um, Lx and Ly, uh, you have sets X and Y, Lx and Ly are the zero matrices on those sets. And in particular, uh, if we're talking about Q being the rig of positive real numbers with in as plus and plus as multiplication, um, then uh, Lx and Ly, those are going to be matrices with infinities everywhere. So there's zeros, but zero is infinity in this way. So it's kind of weird. That's open Q matrix. And the idea is that these two maps point out input and output boundaries for the matrix Q. So here's an example. Um, if you have an open Q matrix um, drawn below, uh, so I guess the matrix form is, is the one on the bottom. Um, and it can be sort of thought of as a weighted graph, which is also open and equipped with input and output boundaries. So because the, the set X has two elements, you get a two by two matrix with all infinities. Um, you have three nodes in the graph in the middle, so you get a three by three matrix. Um, and I guess the self nodes on this graph, um, I didn't use tuples, but that's because the direction, the value is the same in both directions. So on this node on the top, there's a one here indicating that to go from the first node to the first node, it's always one, there's a weight of one, or a cost of one when you travel. Um, so if you have two open Q matrices, um, one from X to Y and one from Y to Z, you can stick them together, or at least you can put them side by side. And this is what they look like put side by side. Uh, you have, uh, so yeah, here's two put side by side. I think that's sort of self-explanatory maybe. Yeah, Y and Z only have one element, so they're one by one matrices. And then you can sort of take the push out in the category map Q. And the push out looks like this. So <clears throat> basically the idea of the push out is you take the push out of the underlying sets and then for the edge weights, um, you, if there's no conflict on the edge weights, like if it's squarely in one of 
for the graphs in the push out or one the other the graph in the push out, then you just use whatever edge weight is already there. If there's a conflict on the edge weights, then you choose the minimum. So the only conflict that happened in this push out is between the six and 0.2. Um, because now, um, once you join those two dots together, um, you're saying that you want to know the, the distance from traveling from that node to itself um, in the push out. And what you do is you take that to be the minimum. And that corresponds to this 0.2 entry down um, in this matrix here. So that's what push outs look like. Um, so for a quantile queue, um, you can form this category or this by category, open if map queue, uh, where objects or sets and morphisms are open queue matrices. Uh, composition is given by push out like I described. And a two morphism is a commutative diagram like I've shown here below. Um, and the reason why it's not a category instead of a bicategory is because push out is only defined up to isomorphism anyway. Um, so it couldn't be associative. You can also form the category open of inmat Q, which is the same by category, uh, same sort of structure by court category, except all the matrices are idempotent. <laughs> so they're open matrices, but now everything is idempotent. These are all idempotent matrices. Um, this community of diagram is a diagram of idempotent matrices. And composition is given by push out, but of idempotent matrices. And that's sort of the tricky part is because now that we're living in a different category, the push out looks a little bit different. And I'll get into a description of what that push out looks like. Because it turns out to be key to understanding sort of the compositionality here. So here's sort of the the main result that I am uh, presenting. And it's that this algebraic path problem functor, which takes a matrix and turns it into an idempotent matrix, um, the free idempotent matrix, or it computes the solution to the algebraic path problem on that matrix. It can be lifted to a functor on the categories or the bicategories of, of open matrices and open idempotent matrices. And the reason why this is good, like I sort of said in the beginning very briefly, is that functoriality of this open of F thing says that, or at least gives a recipe for computing uh, the algebraic path problem on a push out of matrices using the algebraic path problem on each component. So a quick sketch of a proof is that Open of F is defined by pointwise application of F. You just apply F to each piece of B. So it's like F of M, F of N um, for all of those things. And because F is a left adjoint, it preserves push out. And because composition is push out, it also preserves composition. So functoriality of this open of F thing in general, it gives an isomorphism like this between F of the push out of two matrices and the push out of F of those two matrices. But the tricky part is that the second push out lives in a different category. It's in the category of idempotent matrices. And it turns out you can get a description of push outs of idempotent matrices. And what you do is you first take the push out of, of them as regular matrices. Um, and then you apply F to the whole thing. So it's like you are taking the ordinary push out and then taking the free monoid on the result. And use the right adjoint to F. So basically that's, that's the main takeaway here is that if you have a big complicated uh, graph and you want to compute shortest paths on this large graph, um, then it's like they're, they're bound together by these different free monoids. Between every connection between communities of your graph, there's sort of a free monoid connecting them in terms of their 
shortest paths and distances and, and data information like that. Um, so in general, this free monoid computation can require a lot of, a lot of steps, a lot of matrix multiplications. Um, so for example, here's uh, two open transitive graphs. So this is when you're valued in the quantile true and false. So the first one is a, a directed graph from x to y, and the second one is a directed graph from y to z. And you can compose them via push out to get this directed graph. And this deck directed graph, um, if you want to compute the transitive closure of it, there's a path from the node all the way on the left to the node all the way on the right, which takes four steps. So when you are computing the transitive closure, which is a solution to the algebraic path problem on this graph, um, first you have to take the transitive closures of each of them, but these two transitive closures are, nothing happens. <laughs> because there's nothing you can compose. Um, and then you take the push out, and then you have to take the, the free monoid, and you have to go all the way up to the fourth term of that free monoid in order to get all of the paths. So it requires the, the fourth power of this matrix here, the computation of this fourth power. Um, Sorry, one moment. Um, so basically, the floyd warshall algorithm computes the algebraic path problem in theta of n cubed time. So that's basically saying that um, theta of n cubed means that it's bounded by above and below. And n is the number of vertices, and this is uh, this is time complexity. Um, so it does have scalability issues, maybe not as bad as some things, but as your graphs get very large, you do want to reduce that computation time. And sort of this isomorphism that I've been talking about here, it's, it's to just say strategy for doing this. So the first step would be to divide your graph into communities. Uh, then you'd want to compute the solution to the algebraic path problem on each community. Um, and then you'd want to combine them together with the above isomorphism. But like I said before, this relies on choosing your cuts well. So um, it, that, that graph I showed before, it requires a computation of the fourth matrix power of your push out. Um, and ideally, you'd want to do as little of those matrix products as possible. Um, and there's a paper by these folks which, which sort of says that you can choose cuts in, the, in a nice enough graph in a very clever way so that, so that things only flow in one direction between them and actually you only need to compute the first matrix power. So this is very, uh, very Promising, this is very um, suggestive to me, I guess, because it suggests that uh, this strategy of breaking up graphs into smaller components and then computing uh, the algebraic path problem on them and then combining together is something that can work if you choose the heuristics correctly to minimize the interactions between components. Um, okay, so I guess I went through that a lot faster than I expected. Um, <laughs> so hopefully you all have lots of questions. Uh, I'm gonna share a quick little demo. Um, to give some motivation for this. So here's uh, a, a graph called the Twitterverse created by a Twitter user. Um, 
Menander Soder. Um, so here's this graph, and it what it is is it, it it's a graph where users are Twitter users are nodes in this graph. So like we can click on someone here, and get all these Twitter users, um, and then the edges represent following. So there's an edge between nodes if the first node follows the second node. And the colors on the nodes represent automatically generated communities that were learned onto this graph. Um, so this is something that you might want to compute the algebraic path problem on, or you might want to compute maybe shortest distances between uh, pairs of nodes in this graph. And it is a very large graph. This isn't all of Twitter, but there were a bunch of C nodes and generated a pretty big one. And computing the shortest graphs on, or shortest paths on this graph can be pretty expensive. So this is, might be something that you'd want to apply the strategy I was talking about to um, break it up into communities uh, and then compute the shortest paths on the local roads and then combine them together into highways and the, the visual sort of intuition about it is that each of those combinations, each of these things are joined together by free monoids. Um, okay. So I'm going to go back to the other. Um, so here are some references. Uh, there's a quote by, uh, by Goodman about how stars are made and how sort of we build up uh, things from smaller components. So there's a quote that I wanted to say at the end, um, which says that, uh, that stars are built the same way that constellations are. Um, first, you think about its components and then combine them together and mark off the boundaries. So really, the point of that quote is that the way we understand the world is by marking things off into boundaries and then combining them together. Um, so that's really what we're doing here is using that strategy to sort of understand the world and complex systems as well. Okay, um, that's all I've got. I'm, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. So there's a question. Uh, could we think of the last idea about partitioning as a principal way to interpolate between Dijkstra, I, I assume Dijkstra's algorithm, and Floyd Warshall? Former is good for solving same problems as Floyd Warshall for very sparse graphs. So maybe those with favorable partitionings. Yeah. Um, well, so one difference between Dijkstra and Floyd Warshall is that Floyd Warshall is um, all pairs. Uh, and that's sort of my understanding. They have similar uh, times. Dijkstra is a very efficient um, algorithm. Um, this is something that I'm definitely working on exploring more, and I haven't yet. I think that um, these algorithms can maybe the, the, there's more math to put into these algorithms in terms, of, and also more category theory to put into these algorithms that people haven't done yet. So I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure about the connection to sparse graphs. So someone, maybe you can open the chat as so they're saying, right, but repeated dextra can be used for all pairs and for sparse graphs, it outperforms Floyd Warshall. Okay, that seems true. Um, that seems like it very well could be true. Yes, uh, and definitely sparse graphs are, are something that would be interesting to think about. Because if you have a, a graph which is very separated into communities, then that's a sparse graph because most of the off diagonal entries, everything's sort of clustered on the diagonals. Um, so this strategy of breaking things up, I think, would be well suited for, for sparse graphs.
Is open FF a left adjoint? That's a good question. Um, F is a left adjoint. So, so the problem with it being a left adjoint is that, let me go, I'm gonna share a whiteboard. Oh wait, maybe I'm not. So the problem with it being a left adjoint is uh, that- uh, you, you were sharing it, it was working. I don't know if you changed your mind or, but technically it was working. It was working, but my tablet is not working. So I'm just gonna, <laughs> right. So the, the natural candidate for a left adjoint would be open a view, which does go, would, would go in the other direction. But the problem is that uh, U doesn't preserve pushouts because it's a right adjoint, not a left adjoint. So that isn't going to work. It's not going to be functorial. Um, it doesn't mean that there isn't a left adjoint. It's just that the most obvious guess that I would first have um, doesn't quite work. I see. Okay. Are there any more questions? Yes, open, uh, well, it's open enough preserve co-limits. F preserves co-limits. So what are co-limits like in open of F? So co-limits in open of F, I'm pretty sure they're going to be point-wise. So for example, co-product is going to be point-wise co-product. Um, and yes, it is going to preserve co-product. Um, and I think I could prove that. Um, basically, the, the theory of decorated, or not decorated, structured co-spans that uh, John and Kenny Corser have written about um, is a lot fancier than what I've written here. I sort of did a more basic version because I wanted to just highlight the composition structure. But more generally, you get a symmetric monoidal double category, which will often turn into a symmetric monoidal bicategory, where the monoidal product is given by um, co-product. And these left adjoint functors, um, because F preserves co-products, it will turn into a symmetric monoidal functor um, between the categories of open networks. And so it'll preserve co-products at least. And I would guess that it also preserves other co-limits. Yeah, so maybe there is a right adjoint. I'd have to think about that a bit more. Yes, so uh, yeah, if it's a left adjoint, uh, colon preserving functors are left adjoints when the categories are nice enough. <laughs> I'm not sure it preserves all colons. I'm convinced it preserves co products. I have to think about push outs and a bit more to be sure of that. Yeah, so one, one of those conditions is uh, locally finitely presentable, if you're curious, for being a left adjoint if it preserves co-limits. Okay, we yeah. have three more questions. So one is, uh, is the rig you mentioned for weighted graph some, uh, related in some way to tropical geometry? Or is there some algebraic geometric way of interpreting what you're doing? Right, so the, the weighted graph structure is actually over the, the zero infinity reg, I didn't say this name, but it's called the tropical reg usually. Um, so that is the connection to uh, tropical geometry. Um, I don't know much about how, how the tropical reg is used in algebraic geometry, um, but Yes, so it is the tropical rig, and there are people who think about it in that context and maybe use ideas from tropical geometry to think about shortest paths and optimization problems. I see more questions. Should uh, I yeah, them? please repeat them for the people who don't see the chat. Okay. So, Valeria de Paiva said, uh, what part of the quantile structure is your construction using? Um, so really, 
that the most important thing about the quantile structure is that you get is that it, it is that mat q of x is also a quantile if you start with a quantile because uh, there's a theorem of McLean which says that if you are in a monoidal closed category with all co-limits or at least uh, countable co-products then this formula for the free monoid construction works and is an left adjoint. Um, and the quant being a quantile is sufficient to guarantee that because you get all of these um, sort of closedness properties popping out from, from the closedness properties of your underlying quantile. Okay. So Samuel Tanka said, it is like the rig of degrees of polynomials because when you multiply polynomials, their degrees add, and when we add polynomials, they typically decrease too. Um, okay, that was more of a comment. Uh, oh, Itai Weiss said, is open of blank a functor? Um, <clears throat> yes, it is actually. Um, and it's a functor in lots of different contexts. Uh, basically, the, the data of morphisms that it's functorial with respect to, at least the ones I mostly think about, are um, basically triangles over set where everything preserves uh, pushouts. So you need, you need some way to make both of your categories foot replaced. So that's two functors from set into whatever networks you're thinking about. Um, and then you need a functor in between those two networks. And that needs to commute with the foot replacing, at least up to natural isomorphism. And it also needs to preserve pushouts. So given one of those, you can hit it with open and turn that into a, a functor between these categories of open networks. And that's a functor, mm -hmm. or maybe a pseudo functor. A functor morally. <laughs> so Robin said, have you thought a bit about presenting, presenting open id mat in terms of generators and equations? No, I haven't, but that would be great <laughs> because um, I think what you're getting at is that there's lots of, uh, you, if you know generators, you know that it, this category is freely generated by some set then if you wanted to find semantics, all you have to do is define it on those generators. So yeah, that's a good idea. All right, any more questions? Hey, Paul, one more question. This is Valeria, hi Jade. Um, hi. Question is, how far would we be to using this construction on nets, battery nets again? Oh yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. Um, definitely the the NFA example is very similar to Petri nets. Yeah. Um, so that's I think promising. Some I don't know if you can see my screen. Uh, Probably not. not. Yet. Um. I think you're not sharing yet. Share. You are still co-host, so. Oh, okay. Great. Cool. Yeah. So the the NFA example here, um, yeah. it seems very similar to to a Petriant because you're there's very sort of similar machines. And I know there's lots of ways to translate Petriants into different types of automata. Mm -hmm. Um, so I haven't really figured out exactly the way to connect this to Petriants yet, but I think that this is probably a good first one. One, one way to one place to look would be to um, think about first translating them into automata and then thinking about them as automata. Um, another thing is that if you take the free category on a Petriant and then take the think about it as a poset. So you like turn it back into a post set. And then you take the subsets of that, the power set of that, mm -hmm. then you get a quantile, which is sort of a classical result in Petriant theory. 
Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to think about uh, what matrices value in that quantile are and what the solution to the algebraic path problem on that quantile is. Mm -hmm. That's not something I figured out either, but <laughs> it's something I want to think about. Super, thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, that's a good point, Robin, about equational reasoning. Maybe we should go to the SULIP. Yeah, so far we don't have uh, additional questions on SULIP, but of course I encourage everybody who has any questions, even in the next days, to write it there. We can continue the conversation there. And so if there are no more live questions, uh, we can switch to the breakout rooms. So let's thank our speaker again. And see you all either on Zulab or in the breakout rooms in about 30 seconds. Thanks again. Thank you.